You know one problem with these videos so far? We just haven't spent enough time on dead white men and their writing. The problem with me, and it's probably the same thing with you, is that in school no one made me read philosophy. And when I did, they didn't do a good enough job of relating it to my life. But I know that Plato is often seen as the most important philosopher in our culture. It has been said of him, I can't remember by whom, but someone said that all of philosophy after Plato was merely commentaries on what Plato already said. If there is a greatest hits of Plato, it's the allegory of the cave. So let's look at it. I suppose since we're already talking about ethics and we're reading a philosopher, we should probably tackle the question, what exactly is philosophy? Well, definitions will vary, but this is about the best one I've come up with. The study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence, especially when considered as an academic discipline. I'm not completely in love with that, especially when considered as an academic discipline, because I think that limits philosophy to seeming like it's just something us eggheads in the academy do, where I think that people should generally think about philosophy a whole lot more than they do. And... People in other parts of the world do tend to think about philosophy a lot more. One of my best friends is from Romania, and he said they started reading philosophy in, like, third grade. Why don't we? I don't know. But there is a cottage movement in trying to bring philosophy into the mainstream, mostly in books like these that are looking at philosophical takes on popular entertainment. And it's as good of a start as any, I guess. So, we've given a definition of philosophy, and I've showed you a bunch of silly books. The question is, then, what does a philosopher actually do? This is a good quote from Justin Gardner. How is the world created? Is there any will or meaning behind what happens? Is there a life after death? How can we answer these questions? And most important, how ought we to live? I didn't say this was going to be easy stuff. I just said it was going to be important stuff. And this is a great example of the kind of things philosophers think about. Let's get on to Plato. You've read The Allegory of the Cave. This is a nice artistic rendition of it. But just in case something didn't sink in, which I understand because when I first encountered this as an undergrad, I don't think it all sunk in with me. So let's talk about it. There's a cave. The average person is chained and staring at the wall. All the way over here. They can't move their head or anything. There's a stone wall behind them, a fire behind that, and people walk back and forth carrying objects. The shadows are cast on the back wall. And the people back here try to figure out what each item is. They're living in the realm of illusion here. They don't really have a relationship to reality. They think they do. The people who are walking back and forth are in the realm of belief. The farther you get to the cave's exit, and once you get out of the cave, you move past belief through reason into wisdom. Now, I could go on about this one. But I think it would be a lot better if someone who's better suited to, to do it than I gave you a overview of Plato. This is from Ted Ed. I love Ted Talks, and Ted Ed does some great videos. I think you'll enjoy this one. What is reality? Knowledge. The meaning of life. Big topics you might tackle figuratively explaining existence as a journey down a road, or across an ocean, a climb, a war, a book, a thread, a game, a window of opportunity, or an all-too-short-lived flicker of flame. 2,400 years ago, 
one of history's most famous thinkers, said life is like being chained up in a cave, forced to watch shadows flitting across a stone wall. Pretty cheery, right? That's actually what Plato suggested in his Allegory of the Cave, found in Book 7 of The Republic, in which the Greek philosopher envisioned the ideal society by examining concepts like justice, truth, and beauty. In the allegory, a group of prisoners have been confined in a cavern since birth with no knowledge of the outside world. They are chained facing a wall, unable to turn their heads, while a fire behind them gives off a faint light. Occasionally, people pass by the fire carrying figures of animals and other objects that cast shadows on the wall. The prisoners name and classify these illusions, believing they're perceiving actual entities. Suddenly, one prisoner is freed and brought outside for the first time. The sunlight hurts his eyes, and he finds the new environment disorienting. When told that the things around him are real, while the shadows were mere reflections, he cannot believe it. The shadows appeared much clearer to him, but gradually his eyes adjust until he can look at reflections in the water, at objects directly, and finally at the sun, whose light is the ultimate source of everything he has seen. The prisoner returns to the cave to share his discovery, but he is no longer used to the darkness and has a hard time seeing the shadows on the wall. The other prisoners think the journey has made him stupid and blind and violently resist any attempts to free them. Plato introduces this passage as an analogy of what it's like to be a philosopher trying to educate the public. Most people are not just comfortable in their ignorance, but hostile to anyone who points it out. In fact, the real-life Socrates was sentenced to death by the Athenian government for disrupting the social order and his student Plato spends much of the Republic disparaging Athenian democracy while promoting rule by philosopher kings. With the cave parable, Plato may be arguing that the masses are too stubborn and ignorant to govern themselves. But the allegory has captured imaginations for 2,400 years because it can be read in far more ways. Importantly, the allegory is connected to the theory of forms developed in Plato's other dialogues, which holds that, like the shadows on the wall, things in the physical world are flawed reflections of ideal forms, such as roundness or beauty. In this way, the cave leads to many fundamental questions, including the origin of knowledge, the problem of representation, and the nature of reality itself. For theologians, the ideal forms exist in the mind of a creator. For philosophers of language viewing the forms as linguistic concepts, the theory illustrates the problem of grouping concrete things under abstract terms. And others still wonder whether we can really know that the things outside the cave are any more real than the shadows. As we go about our lives, can we be confident in what we think we know? Perhaps one day a glimmer of light may punch a hole in your most basic assumptions. Will you break free to struggle towards the light even if it costs you your friends and family? Or stick with comfortable and familiar illusions? Truth or habit? Light or shadow? Hard choices, but if it's any consolation, you're not alone. There are lots of us down here. I think that works as a pretty good introduction. Yeah, it's kind of brainy stuff. Some takeaways I think that are important is one, the fact that Plato did not particularly like a democracy was it shouldn't really surprise us. I mean, you think that you go back into the cave and try to help people that like you, but I have taught long enough to know that's not always the case. Many people are quite happy in their own little world with their own preconceptions. And anything to shake them out of that world can be problematic, to say the very least. And here's the thing. Throughout history, a lot of people have agreed with Plato, including most of the founding fathers, the way our government was set up was to try to put as many things in between us and power as humanly possible, because more people were afraid of mob rule than were afraid of a dictator. 
And it really would be a dictatorship if Plato had his way. There will be no end to the troubles of state or of humanity itself till philosophers become kings in this world, or till those we now call kings and rulers really and truly become philosophers, and political power and philosophy thus come into the same hands. It is another interesting thing to note when somebody goes off on what the best world would be like and, oh, by the way, it's me in charge. I think Plato would be kind of annoying to tell you the truth. Anyway, there are people who use the allegory of the cave a lot to make various statements. And the idea that 24-hour news networks and popular entertainment are the current version of the allegory of the cave is something to really think about, as is this one, which is probably my favorite, Plato's Rave. And then there's Plato's Man Cave. And they're satirical, yeah, but the real point here is that a lot of the things we think of as popular entertainment are designed to stop us from really thinking about how the world works. Is that a depressing thought? Well, yeah, it is, but I never said that he was going to be a happy-go-lucky man, this Plato. He's just a philosopher king. So, does this mean that he's the best person in the history of the world, that he's admirable in every way? But then again, he had wacky ideas like this. Incidentally, he also thought that the womb in the woman was a living organism that could crawl around its body at will. Yeah. And we must beg Homer and the other poets not to be angry if we strike out these and similar passages, not because they are unpoetical or unattractive to the popular ear but because the greater the poetical charm in them, the less they are meant for the ears of boys and men who are meant to be free and who should fear slavery more than death. Plato did not like popular culture. He did not like anything which did not directly influence people to believe in philosopher kings. You shouldn't have entertainment. You should have stuff that puts you in the proper philosophical mindset to rule others. We must remain firm in our conviction that hymns to the gods and praises of famous men are the only poetry which ought to be admitted in our state. And these are all from the Republic. It's an interesting read. He goes right up to where you want to follow him, and then he just keeps going right over the edge in a lot of places. I don't want to seem like I'm bagging too much on him, but we need to have an open eye when we look at our authors, when we look at the people who were responsible for a lot of what's called Western culture. But I got a few other silly things. Attention to health is a great obstacle to the practice of virtue and improvement in life. And for whatever reason, I have hardly ever known a mathematician who is capable of reasoning. Why did he hate math? I don't know. Why did Twain hate the French? Incidentally, the quote I used earlier, which were the questions a philosopher asked, come from this book, Sophie's World. It's an introduction to philosophy written as a young adult fiction novel. The protagonist is a 14-year-old girl who's being taught philosophy. It reads pretty well, and it covers pretty much everything from the pre-Platonists on up through the existentialists. It's well worth it. With the allegory of the cave, you really have to put on a bunch of different hats to get the real meaning out of it. And particularly, you have to think a little bit metaphorically here. Because no one's actually going to chain people up into a cave. I don't think you can get away with that nowadays. At least not in the modern university setting. But if you look at the allegory of the cave as an allegory and use your metaphorical levels of thinking, which we've been practicing with our writing skills builders, you can start to get some real meaning out of it. What are the things that distract us from the truth? When you state it like that, a lot of our modern world seems like an obvious, obvious fit. Do people in our society really want to know the truth? What happened if you tried to tell them? 
Unless you thought we were the only generation that went through this stuff, Plato's around. And the fact that someone started asking these questions, well, it makes it valuable for us. And I hope you got some value out of it. See you next video.